What did they influence you to do that you would not have done if they hadn't been around? I love to ask the question that no one ever asks. Who are they? They are a few who seem like everybody in our mind. The sway of they. The wrong they will keep you in the fray. The right they will keep you above the fray. Where did the wheels fall off? When did everything start messing up? They, they, they always say, I had these friends. You show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Good morning, Mount Movers Church. Good morning to our guests. And good morning to those of you guys that are joining us online. We're really excited. Today, we're going to be offering you guys a standalone message, all right? We're not going to be launching a new series like we, like we normally do. Next week, we're going to be launching this awesome party. Uh, I would say on the pavement, but we don't really have any pavement here. I wish we had pavement. That would be the highway. So we're not going to have a party on the highway, but we are going to have a party next week as we uh, indulge in Rediscover Church. We're going to have the chili cook-off and the shotgun shoot. So, so next week is going to kind of be a standalone in itself. So you guys have heard the saying that you become a product of your environment. How many of you guys have ever heard that saying before? We become a product of our environment. Well, I want to bring a little bit of... Um, um, I want to bring this around to reality and get, go a little bit deeper than that, okay? The truth of the matter really is, is, is that we become a product of the people in our environment. If you think about that, it's so unbelievably true. We become a product of the people in our environment. The effect that people have on one another is absolutely powerful. It's powerful, the effect that people have on one another. Think about the influence of family and the influence of friends. Our parents get the first shot, don't they? Right? They, they teach us, uh, mom and dad teach us really everything about life. They give us the jump start on life and they teach us to become who we're going to become. They, they teach us how to act, how to think, how to speak. Mama teaches you how to dress. Oh my gosh. My mom, fortunately, was a very snazzy woman, awesome, classy gal, and she made me the little rock star. She was awesome. But some mamas don't know how to dress their kids. I'm not going to go into that. I'm just saying that they scar their kids for life, and it is a travesty. It, it's horrible. They, they should not even attempt it. Let dad do it. So, but they teach us the most important things about life. They teach us how to treat others, even uh, how to think about God, if you will. They give us that spiritual foundation. Our family does. Our parents really have a huge part in helping us to become who we become in life, right? Right? And then what happens? Then we go to school, and we get around these friends, and there's all sorts of different friends to choose from, right? All sorts of different kids to play with and have a good time. And through grade school, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty neutral. Anybody goes because, you know, they're kids. But by the time you reach about sixth grade, mid-school, it starts to get pretty complicated. You know what I mean? It starts to get complicated because then the kids kind of start to, I don't know, spread out and become... Uh, Different. There, there becomes distinctions between different types of kids, whether you, you want to be a jock, a hick, a, a prep, right, a, a geek, a freak, I don't know, but there's lots of different options once you hit middle school. There's lots of choices. They're plentiful, but it's exhausting, right, because then you've got these kids that, that it, it becomes so complicated, they end up just trying to fit in somewhere. They don't know where to fit in, and then they, they're asking themselves the question, who am I? Who am I supposed to be? And so they're constantly trying to find themselves, and here I stand, 38 years old, and I still don't know who I am. So, so really, it's a very complicated process, right? I marry this beautiful woman from the country, right? And, and, and I, I don't know. I'm so torn in my spirit. I've never really known who I am because I love the country. I love hunting. I listened, you know, all grown up, I listened to country music. I thought I, thought I was Garth Brooks. I thought, it, I thought if he dies, I will take his place because I know every one of his songs by heart because I listened to them falling asleep in the seventh grade every night. I was Garth, okay? And then I married this beautiful, but I live in Kansas City and I meet this woman and she convinced me that I was not a country boy. I don't know what gave her that clue, but she said, you are, I, I know, she said, I grew up in the country and I know one thing, you are not country. 
But what's hilarious is neither is she. Because seriously, even though she grew up in the country, she's more city, right? And, and honestly, in my heart of hearts, I'm more country. Really, honestly, if you know me, I am. But we have this crazy, like, flip-flop. So we, we just make each other perfect. We just balance each other out. But it's a complicated process trying to figure out who you want to be. But friends really help you to determine who you're going to be in life. The people that you hang out with are really, really determine the kind of person you are going to become. You saw an intro video this morning of Pastor Ed Young, and he is an amazing pastor of Fellowship Church uh, in Dallas, Texas, in Irving, Texas, an amazing man of God. And uh, actually, some of, uh, some of the excerpts that we're going to bring to you today are from his awesome book, Fifty Shades of They, and I encourage you to get it. You can, um, you can order it online, or if you want to place an order at the connecting point, you can Or you, you can, can just get it off the shelf. Do we have in some in mood. stock? We have <laughs> some in stock, people. Yes, you can order one of these yeah, today, or you can take it right off the shelf. That's awesome. So make sure and, and get that book. It's an awesome book about relationships. And, and Ed Young says this in his book. He says, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. What a powerful statement that's so true. It reminds me of, you know, growing up, if, for those of you guys who have heard my testimony, you know that I've not always been as perfect as I am now. I have, I have a little bit, a little bit of a past and, uh, you know, had, as every teenage boy has plenty of opportunities to get in trouble, I got in plenty of trouble, trust me, even as a kid. Let me just give you a little rewind on Pastor Brad, okay? You'll probably never think of me the same, but, but when I was a boy, I'm telling you, I hung out with some kids that just were really up to no good. I mean, we were a rough little crew. I mean, I wouldn't say we were like a gang or anything, but... You're like 10 years old, 11 years old, we, were, we, we had ourselves a little crew, and we got into a lot of trouble. Now, my mom's sitting in the congregation this morning, uh, and so I'm a big boy, and I can handle what correction may come afterwards, but I'm going to let her in on a few things that she has no idea happened when I was 10 years old. So, so these boys and I, man, we would, you know, we had our, we had our BMX bikes, right, and our mullets, right? And so we were making our way through the neighborhood, and, and uh, I remember one time we would go to this gas station after my mom specifically told me not to. It was called uh, Conoco, okay, in Kansas City, and it wasn't very far from where we lived. Um, yeah, it was, and, and that's why she didn't want me to go. And, and so we'd go to Conoco, and I remember one day being in the gas station, and we were just looking around, and my buddy, okay, I look down, and he grabs some big leek chew, right? It's bubble gum for those of you guys who may not know, all right? So he puts it in his pocket. I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder why he would put it in his pocket if he's just going to put it on the counter. Why would he do that? And then he runs out. And I'm like, oh, crap. I know what we're doing now. We're going so, to jail. <laughs> so I thought I have two choices. I can either pay his consequences or I can run really fast. So I ran really fast, and I got on my bike. And we took off, and I was thinking, what on earth? And, and, and I, on, okay, I'll be honest with you, really. Okay, I kind of felt bad until I got some of the gum, and I realized, score. And, 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 but, but, <laughs> but I thought, something not quite right about this. I knew better than to do that. And then it got kind of gradually worse as I began to hang out with these same guys. It got to where we were, like, riding up in intersections on our bikes and, like, spitting on people with their windows down. And, and, and then we would, we would mess with, with cops and we'd try to get them to chase us because we loved a good chase. And so we'd hack them off or do something really bad or take a kid's bike or something. And then we'd end up in a chase and we'd have to head to the woods and hide out for a day or two. And it was, it was, it was pretty interesting. And, and so I remember when I, when I got into high school, okay, different crew, but this guy that I was hanging out with now, <laughs> You know, when, when, when he has one of those, you know, uh, one of those uh, electronic bracelets on his ankle. Should it, <laughs> I'm thinking, it's a good guy, you know. We, we had a lot of fun. We played a lot of Garth tunes together in the basement. You know, just hanging out and having fun and playing guitars. And, and, and it was his birthday. And he said, he said, Brad, he said, I really want to do something. Just, I want to have some fun for my birthday. And so, 
you know, we're in Kansas City, mind you, and he said, you know, you always tell me about this, uh, this Missouri spook light. Have you, how many of you guys have ever heard of the Missouri spook light? <laughs> All right, we live close enough. I think everybody probably knows what it is, but it's just outside of Seneca, Missouri, and he said, you've told me all these stories about growing up and going and seeing the spook light, and those are awesome stories, and I want to see it for myself for my birthday. I thought, dude, that's like three hours away, man. Okay, let's go. That's awesome. So, so we loaded up the car, and it was like dark. Like, it's already nighttime. So we're going to drive three hours. So we drive three hours. Now I'm like, I'm like 16, 17 maybe. And, and so we go down to see the spook light, and we sat there retarded, stupid. We didn't even see nothing. And, and, then, and so by this time, it's like 2 in the morning, and I'm exhausted, right? And, and so we... Uh, and did I mention I didn't have any money? So my car is on empty, right? And I'm like, I've got to get back to Kansas City. And this bum doesn't have any money, of course, because he spent most of his childhood in jail. And so, so we pull into the gas station, and I'm like, what am I going to do? And so, we, you know, of course, you fill up first, and you ask later, you know, what am I going to do? So I fill up the tank, and I'm like, I, there's no way out of this. He doesn't have any money. I don't have any money. we got to get home. So I took off. I know, Mom. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. So no, it gets it gets it gets pretty good. So so <laughs> so so I pull off. So I'm like, all right, let's go, let's go, let's go. And and so we pull off, right? We're tearing out of there, in, in right? Tear, I know. I see the look on my mom's face. <laughs> We're tearing out of there. No, you don't get it. Twenty feet after I leave the pump, my transmission goes out. Oh my God! We're going to jail! We're going! Please! God, please! Lord, please! See, I knew better. I said, God, please, please, please let me get out of here and I will go to church. I will love you. I will serve you. I, 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 will, I will do everything right and nothing wrong. Please let me get out of here. And the transmission kicked back in. Now, I am not saying go steal gas. And God will, God will bless it. Okay, but listen. So, so I made it. I made it out of the gas station. I made it out of the gas station, and tried heading home. About halfway, it start. You know, transmission when it starts to go out, it, it it can be gradual at times. So it was going in and out the whole way home. And then I fell asleep. Mom, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Wait a minute. This story gets really good. So, so this, this guy had, uh, that I was with, his name's Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Um, he had just, like, a month or two earlier been in a head-on collision with another driver because it wasn't good. He broke, like, almost every bone in his body. His leg was in a cast, okay? And, and halfway there, I fell asleep because he, he didn't realize that I'm, like, narcoleptic. <clears throat> when I get behind the wheel, I fall asleep real easy. So, but, but it's like three in the morning, so give me a break. So, so we're halfway there, and I, 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 like, I fall asleep, doze off a little bit. And so, so we wake up, spin in circles in the median, in the grass. It's all good. And a car is coming towards us, and we almost lose our lives and die. And he had a look on his face like, because he had just been in a head-on collision. He was really freaked out because, like, he's having flashbacks from what happened, uh, like, a month before when he was in a head-on collision, and it really scared him bad, and it was a really bad deal. And so we made it home, and by the time I made it to my driveway, that car never moved an inch again. The transmission officially went out. Now, what is the point of that story? I was hanging out with the wrong kind of people. Wrong kind of people. In fact, I was with the same guy, and it wasn't long after that. I was riding around town with him, and we go to the gas station. He fills up. He goes inside to pay, and then the guy comes out because he wasn't. Gonna, he was trying to leave and not pay for gas. I'm like, dude, didn't we learn the lesson the first time? What is the problem? Why are you not getting this? I hung out with the wrong people, and and if I and I and something clicked, all right, something clicked inside of me that helped me to realize it. If and it was God, obviously. If, if I'm going to keep hanging out with people like this, doing the things we're doing, this guy is going to literally determine my future. And not just him, but, but everybody else that I was hanging out with. I was becoming just like them. And my future was becoming so, so clear to me as to what I would become. 
That's right. When I met Brad in college and he started telling me all these stories, I said, "There's," because he used to say, I really wish we would have met in a grade school and went to high school together. We'd have had so much fun being sweethearts. And I said, I wouldn't have even looked at you in high school. <laughs> you were not the kind of person I would have hung out with. Not that I was a goody two-shoes, but I would not have been your friend. But I met you years later. Well, and I just hear all your fun stories. Well, I would have looked at you. That, <laughs> that I hope my children don't ever emulate. If you have your word this morning, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. I'm going to show you exactly what Brad should have understood when he was 16 years old. And it says this, don't be fooled by those who say such things for bad company corrupts good character. Bad company, those bad friends, those people who are not up to any good, those people who have not learned to study the word of God and implement it into their lives, those people who are headed down the wrong path, those people will corrupt your good character. We see it all the time. You start hanging out with somebody that honestly, maybe you even think, maybe I could rub off on them. Maybe I could be a good influence on them. But you know what? If you start hanging out with a negative person, guess what? Pretty soon you will hear yourself being negative. You start hanging out with a gossip, pretty soon you will start gossiping. It works the opposite way as well. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 27 and 17, as iron sharpens iron, so as a friend sharpens a friend. See, today we don't really want to focus on the bad, although that was a really funny story. We don't want any of you to do that. What we want to focus on is this right here. Iron sharpens iron. If you get around the right kind of people, you get around authentic men and women of God, you get around good influences, you get around people who are doing the right thing, they will start sharpening and encouraging you. And you know what's interesting about that? I have always been more of an introvert, so I never pushed my way through a crowd to meet anybody. Like, if we would have gone to a concert, I would have not been the one in the front row trying to, like, get a hold of whoever was on stage. I would never want to wait in line to shake somebody's hand. But Brad, on the other hand, as you all know, Pastor Brad is the total opposite of me. He is a complete extrovert. And everybody we've ever met, I mean, if it was like the most, if it was anybody, the president, Brad would make his way, no doubt, through a crowd of people to get up to somebody he wanted to meet. Am I selling the truth? Yeah, but the, the illustration truth. you gave right before lie. that was was like laying across the top of a stage trying to touch some sort of well, singer. Like, like, I wouldn't do that to Garth because that's like... Wow, exactly. It's kind of weird. You probably did. No, that's I didn't day, do that. Another day. That's a but I'd hang out backstage day. to meet him. That'd be but cool. But you definitely <laughs> would have. But here's the thing. A lot of times we don't want to push our way into having a relationship with somebody who we feel like maybe they are a step above us. Okay? And I don't mean in status. I mean in their relationship with God. Sometimes we look at people and we think to ourselves, I would really want to be their friend. But man, I don't, have my, I don't have my act together. I don't have my life together. I'm not... I don't do the same things they do. And I want to tell you that if you'll push your way into a relationship with somebody, and I'm going to give an example, and man, I pick on her a lot, but Brandy right here, Brandy is one that kind of did that with me. Now, I love Brandy, but I'll tell you this. When Brandy first came here, I, I despise talking on the phone. So if you call me, I'll just tell you right now, okay? I screen all my calls. I screen my mother's calls, my brother's calls, my sister's calls, my calls, Mitchell's calls, Brad's calls. I screen them all, okay? I'll listen to the message and I'll call you back if, it, if I need to, or I'll text you if I don't need to talk on the phone. I don't like the phone. But Brandy, when she was really coming into her relationship with Christ and, and walking through some junk, she started calling me. Now, I guess she hadn't got the memo. Like, I don't like the phone. Like, I don't know what you're doing, crazy lady. I don't like to talk on the phone. And we would have these long conversations. And as I'm on the phone, Brad's like, you're doing the right thing. You need to encourage her. Da -da -da. I'm like, I don't like talking on the phone. And then the next thing I know, forget the phone. She'd knock on the door. You know what I'm like? It's like, honey, Brandy's here. Ah! You don't, like, show up to my house unannounced. Like, my house might be a mess. I might not look right, right? She didn't care. She'd come on in. I'm like, okay. She is no respecter so of persons. I she's just like us. <laughs> I laugh because <laughs> now she's my sister-in-law. She pushed her way into a relationship. Now, I'm not saying I'm that hard to have a friendship with, but. Yeah, you are. 
I kind of am. You are. I don't have a lot of outside friends. It's okay. It just is what it is. But what's funny about that is she knew that she wanted to have an influence from us. She knew that God was in our life, and I'm not putting us up on a pedestal, but she knew that we knew how to get a hold of God. She knew when she was going through something, she could get around us and we could help her through that hard time. And she pushed her way in. She wasn't going to let the fact that I didn't want to talk on the phone bother her. She didn't, she didn't care if my house was a mess. I mean, she was like, where's your broom? I'm like, we don't even own one. It's at the church. I mean, like everything we had, she was like, you don't have anything. I'm like, no, it's all at the church. But what's crazy is that a lot of times in our life, we settle for the influences that are around us. Listen to me. We go to work and we think, well, the people I work with, I don't have a choice, right? And my family, I don't have a choice whether or not they influence me. Yes, you do. I don't care if they're blood or not. If your family's not a great influence, you have a decision to make in your life as to how much time you spend with them. If the people you work with at your job are not a great influence on your life, you have an opportunity to just disregard the things that they're trying to tell you while you're working and just be like, I got to work. You have a choice who influences you. And what we're telling you today is that you need to get around people who are greater than yourself. You need to get around people who have already walked down the road you want to go. You need to get around people who are going to encourage you, who are going to push you, who are going to make you grow in your relationship. You know, the Bible tells us a really cool story about Elijah and Elisha. Maybe you guys have heard of these guys or maybe you haven't. But in 2 Kings chapter 2, there's a story I want to read to you, and it's awesome. Elijah, let me give you some background. Elijah was a prophet. He was an incredible man of God. In the Old Testament, they did not have the entire Word of God like we do, okay? They didn't have churches. They didn't have pastors. But they would have prophets who were men of God who everybody knew they could hear from God, and what they, what they said was going to happen always happened. Elijah was one of those guys. Well, Elisha was a young guy, okay, younger in age, and he wanted to have a relationship with Elijah the prophet. And Elijah had kind of allowed it, man. He had kind of brought him in as his understudy. He kind of brought him next to him and let him go out as he did ministry and let him go out as he did things. And then there came the time when God was ready to take Elijah home. And for some reason, Elisha knew it. Elisha knew, like, today is the day Elijah's going to heaven. It's going to happen today. I want you to hear what happens. In 2 Kings chapter 2, it says this in verse 2. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. Now I want you to notice how many times in this passage the word stay here is used. Elijah was not wanting Elisha to be following him around. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Look at how persistent he is. The group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked, Did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? He said, Of course I know. Be quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Hey, stay here. Once again. For the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. But Elisha replied again, As surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down to Jericho. Then that group of prophets, here they come again, from Jericho, they came to Elisha and they asked him, did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answered. Be quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to the Jordan River. But again, Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on again together. Fifty men from the group of prophets also went and they watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. Then Elijah folded his cloak. That was kind of like the outer garment that he had on. And everybody knew that the cloak, it was recognized as what the prophet wore, okay? A lot of times it was made out of like an animal hair. It was, or kings would wear it. So it was not something normal people wore. This was not just like a coat. Then Elijah folded up his cloak together. He struck the water with it. The river divided. And the two of them went across on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. Now pause. 
How many of you know that when you're persistent, you'll wear people down, you'll eventually get what you want? How many of you parents, if your kids wear you down long enough, sometimes you give in and they get what they want? None of you want to admit it, whatever. You know what, if your kids keep going on and on and on, sometimes you'll be like, oh my goodness, here's five bucks. Do whatever you wanted to do, right? Although my kids, it's, it's gone beyond five bucks to more and more and more. They're just like every day. Brad said, do you think we're an ATM? One day last week, $72 in one day had to go to school. $72. Yeah. But they kept saying, I need a t-shirt for band. I need 40 bucks for shoes for band. I need this. I need this. And I kept putting them off and putting them off and putting them off until one day I was like, oh, my word. Is band really necessary? Who cares what you wear? And out the money goes, right? Elisha knew that if he was persistent, he would get what he wanted. And this happened to be a really good thing. So Elijah finally says, dude, just tell me what you want. Just tell me what you want. And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. I want to become your successor. Elisha knew that Elijah had a connection with Almighty God that he did not have. Elijah was a man of power. He was an authentic man of God. And Elisha said, dude, I want to be just like you. I want the spirit that's inside of you to rest on me. I want God to move and use me the way that he moves and uses you. I want to get around greatness. He had followed this dude around from town to town to town to town to town, almost to the point of being really annoying. Let's see what happens. You've asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. But if you see me when I'm taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. Now, without even telling you the rest of the story, do you think Elisha gave up or do you think he continued to follow him around? You guys are boring. He continued to follow him around. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. How many want to go that way? Yeah. No right dying. Here. Just come get me in a Woo! chariot of fire and take me to heaven. That's how Elijah went home. Elijah saw it and he cried out, My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel. And as they have disappeared from my side, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he had taken it up. Then Elisha returned back to the banks of the Jordan River. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the river divided, and Elisha went across. When the group of prophets from Jericho saw from a distance, remember these guys were hiding out. They were hiding out to see what was happening. They exclaimed, Elijah's spirit rests upon Elisha. They went out to meet him and they bowed down before him. This is one of the coolest stories ever. You can go back and you can read a little bit more if you want to go to 2 Kings and read the rest of it. But here's the thing. Elisha had made up his mind. I'm not just going to influ- I'm not going to be influenced by just anybody. I'm not just going to hang out with anybody. I've made a decision. I want to be just like this authentic man of God. And because it, I'm going to get right up next to him because how many know if you get right up next to somebody, they start to rub off on you. You ever had your kids come in filthy dirty and they want to hug and you're like, "No!" Oh, sweaty. Why? Nasty. Why? Stinky. Because it rubs off on you. Yeah. Elisha knew that. And he said, I want that greatness. I want that spirit of Almighty God resting on the inside of me. That's what God wants from each of us. He wants us to get around greatness. When you hang around or get around greatness, great people, that greatness is going to rub off on you. I don't know about you guys. I want greatness in my relationship with God. I want greatness in my marriage. I want greatness in my kids. I want greatness in my finances. I want greatness in in my mind, in my health, in my time, in my ministry. I want greatness all around because in every area of my life, I want to bring greatness to God because He's worthy. He's worthy of my very, very best and nothing less. I don't want to just settle for average or ordinary. I want the extraordinary things that God has for my life. Is that what you want? Are you okay with average? Are you okay with just giving God your your leftovers? Leftovers are for the dogs. I give my dogs scraps. I don't give God my scraps. I want to give God my very, very, very 
best. I want to be great for God in every area of my life. And the way we do that is we get around greatness. Greatness is contagious. So who do you know in your life that exhibits greatness in their lives? My challenge to you today would be get around those people. Because he, here's the fact. If you, keep, if you keep on this plane in life and you keep hanging around the same people you're hanging around in your life, the same results that you've been given are the same results that you're going to have as, as we move forward through this life, through this journey. And it has so much to do with the people that you have placed yourself around. If you want different results, get some different people around you. Start doing things differently with different people and watch how God just totally and completely changes your life. You've got to get around greatness. Greatness is contagious. Would you stand up today? I hope that this has encouraged you and challenged you. Who do you know that's great in the relationship with God? Get around them. Who, who do you know that's great in, in, in parenting or, or has a great marriage? Get around them. Who do you know that has great financial, uh, uh, um, great financial peace? Get around them. Who do you know that has the mind of Christ? Who do you know that's, that, that loves ministry? Who do you know that really knows how to manage their time well for the glory of God? Get around them. And I promise you, when you begin to hang out with those people, they're going to rub off on you. They're going to teach you what they know about greatness. You know, for me, th this, is, this, is, this really means a lot to me, this message, because I have found it to be so true in my life. You know, Pastor Ed Young, um, he's an amazing man of God. And, you know, we've, we've met him numerous times, and, and he has one of the largest churches in America. And he loves God with all of his heart. And, and every time, every year, just about, we go to see him, and, and he has an unbelievable conference called C3. And, and at C3, there's lots of other pastors who are great, incredible men and women of God. And we continually, continually put ourselves around people like this because we want the greatness that God has given them to rub off on us. And every time, it never fails, every time we're around great people, man, we're just like sponges. And we ask questions. And they pour into us. And, and, and honestly, you know, a lot of... A lot of the reasons why, you know, I think God has done what He's done in our ministry is because of the people that we've put ourselves around. We just, you know, one of those pastors is, you guys know Pastor Shannon O'Dell, just an amazing, amazing man of God and has seen so much impact on the harvest because of what God has done through his life. And as we've just forced ourselves into his life, you know, we, we pulled a brandy on him, honestly. We did. He didn't even see it coming. But now we're the best friends, we, you know, we love him. I think he loves us. I think. I'm not sure yet, but, but he's an amazing man of God. He has taught us so much, and now it's at the point where we can just call him anytime, and and, and, and he just pours into us as a mentor, and he's amazing. And so I, I, I tell you that because I want you guys to not settle for where you're at in your life. I want to encourage you to find somebody that has greatness just oozing off of them. I want you to get around them. And, and always strive to be better and better and better for the glory of God. How many of you guys today would say, I, I want that. I want greatness in my life. Would you be honest with the Lord today? Amen. I want greatness in my life. I want to pray for you that God would begin to do that. I want to pray that right now that he would just begin to show you those people that you need to put yourself around. And in the same respect, like Misty was saying, if there's people in your life that are taking greatness away from your life, you need, you need to cut the cord to cut the cord. You need to separate yourself. Unless God has you on a ministry assignment, you need to cut that cord right now and get around greatness. Let me pray for you. Father, we are so needy for you to deposit greatness in our lives. Surround us, Lord, with the right day. Surround us with the right people, at the right time, to help us to become the people you want us to become. We know that greatness is contagious. And I pray that you would just surround us with the right people, God. 
for such a time as this. God, we just honor you right now. I pray that even right now as we're praying that you would just begin to, to reveal to each and every one of us, God, who that person is that we need to just, we just need to be around them. We just need to rub shoulders with them. Show us who that would be in our lives today, Father. And Father, I pray, I pray, God, that you would put within each and every one of us a hunger to be better today than we were yesterday for your glory so that we can impact lives all around us each and every day. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed today, I want to I want to quickly give an invitation to those of you who might want to make Jesus your Savior and your friend. You might say, Pastor Brad, I want greatness in my life, but, but I, don't, I don't even have a relationship with Jesus, and I, I know that I need that. I want you just to pray this prayer. Say, Father, I love you, and I thank you for your son, Jesus. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. I confess Him as Lord right now. And I dedicate from this moment forward that I will live for you, God, according to your word. Surround me with great people. Groom me for greatness. Help me to be something for you. Help me to win the lost, whatever the cost. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many of you guys are going to find somebody great to get around? Amen. Give God praise if you love him today. Hey, thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself, give to our ministry. We've made giving easy here at Mountain Movers Church. If you have your smartphone, just text the number. 918-223-8090. Just push in the amount you want to give and push send. It's that easy. If you don't have your smartphone, not a problem. You can mail your giving just as easy to 24,000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma, 74344. Thanks for watching today. Hey, remember, we're dreaming big for you. We'll see you next week.